Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about Hoffman and Kurtzus rearrangements, which is a very old and yet useful method of taking carboxylic acids and converting them into primary amine, cutting one carbon off from our chain in the process. So the way this scheme is going to work, we are going to start with a carboxylic acid. Then we are going to convert that carboxylic acid into the acid chloride and from that point we are going to hit the fork in the road. If we convert our carboxylic acid into the corresponding amide, that would be the Hoffman pathway. However, if we convert our acid chloride into the corresponding azide, that one is going to be Kurzu's pathway. But then, regardless of which pathway we are dealing with, we are going to form the isocyanate, which, after the hydrolysis, either acidic or basic, going to give us the corresponding amine plus carbon dioxide, which will typically just fly away unless we're dealing with the um, basic conditions, then it's going to make a carbonate, but I digress. And since we have quite a few moving parts in this scheme, let's look at each reaction individually. First, I want to start with the formation of the acid chloride. While there are many different ways how we can make our acid chlorides, the method with the thionyl chloride, SOCl2, is probably the most common one. And the way this method works, first we are going to take our thionyl chloride and we are going to do the nucleophilic attack from our carboxylic acid onto thionyl chloride, kicking one of the chlorines out, making the following intermediate and Cl-. Now, there are a couple of different pathways uh, that we can take from this point. I'm going to show the one where the uh, pyridine is going to come in and deprotonate our intermediate like so, giving me the following derivative, and then from this point I'm going to show my Cl- coming in and attacking my carbonyl like this, making the following tetrahedral intermediate, from which we are going to kick our living group out, and in this case the living group is going to be this entire sulfur-containing moiety, giving us our acid chloride, SO2, sulfur dioxide, which typically just going to fly away as a gas, and pyridinium, which was protonated uh, before in the previous step, and Cl-, which is going to be a counter ion to that. And as I've mentioned, there is an alternative way of showing this mechanism, where we first do the attack by Cl- and then deprotonate our molecule, and whichever method you decide to do here, well, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you are still going to get the same acid chloride, and we can argue for the rest of the universe which method is the best way of representing this mechanism. If in your class your instructor prefers one way over the other one, well, just go with whatever your instructor likes, because at the end of the day, I am not the one who is going to give you your grade. So now, when we have our acid chloride, we can move on to the next step, and first I'm going to look at the Hoffman pathway. So in the Hoffman pathway, the first part of the reaction is going to be the formation of the amide, which is just a typical acyl substitution reaction. Ammonia is going to come in, attack our carbonyl, giving us our tetrahedral intermediate, then we are going to bring the second equivalent of our ammonia, that's why we need excess of that, because one of those ammonia is going to be our base in this case, and we are going to make an intermediate looking like this, and from this point chlorine is going to leave our molecule, giving us our amide. Now, if I go back to my general scheme for a moment here, after we form the uh, amide in the Hoffman pathway, this molecule over here, after that point we are going to be doing reaction with Br2 in the presence of sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to go back to my scheme over here and I'm going to show this hydroxide, which is going to come in and deprotonate our amide, giving me the following intermediate. And this proton transfer step is fairly easy to do, because uh, amides have PKE of roughly 15, so we are going to expect a reasonable equilibrium constant for this particular step. But now, once we have this uh, uh, negatively charged species, that is a good nucleophile, and since at this point we have an electrophile present in our system, those two are going to react with each other, giving
giving us the following highlight. And if you thought that that step looks kind of familiar, it is because you have seen a very similar interaction when we were talking about the halogenation of the enolates in basic conditions. The idea here is kind of the same. Now, the proton that we have over here on the nitrogen is actually even more acidic than what we had before because the bromine that we have now sitting on our nitrogen is going to be pulling the electron density towards itself to some extent. It is playing a role of the electron withdrawing group. How much more acidic that thing is? Eh, it's kind of difficult to say. I don't think that there are any measurements of that. But what we do know is that the second equivalent of our base comes in and easily deprotonates that position, giving us the following negatively charged intermediate. And what is important about this species is that it is fairly unstable, so it is going to be immediately decomposing via the rearrangement. So what's going to happen here is that the alkyl group is going to migrate onto the nitrogen, the halogen is going to pop off, and the nitrogen going to make a double bond with the carbon. So let me draw it ugly first. This bond over here is now moving onto the nitrogen, so I'm making a new carbon-nitrogen bond right over here. Now, these electrons that I have on the nitrogen, these guys are moving between nitrogen and carbon. So I'm making a carbon-nitrogen bond. And finally, this bond that I used to have between nitrogen and bromine, these electrons are moving onto bromine, becoming an electron pair. And since bromine had other electron pairs there to begin with, now that is going to be a negatively charged anion. So let me take this ugly drawing and I am now going to redraw that in a more presentable way with the reasonable bond angles, giving us the structure of this isocyanate. And notice how the carbon that used to be a part of my four carbon chain has now been ripped off and there is a nitrogen between the rest of the chain and this carbon. This carbon is what we are going to end up losing during the hydrolysis. But before we go to the hydrolysis step, let's look at how this reaction goes via the Kurzus way. And while we are here, let me emphasize one more time that this is a Kurzus rearrangement, not Curtius. Theodor Kurzus was a German chemist and his last name has nothing to do with courtesy. So as a token of respect, I will encourage you to pronounce his name more or less appropriately. Anyways, coming back to my reaction here, azide is an excellent nucleophile. So this N3 species is going to react with my carbonyl, attacking it directly, giving me my tetrahedral intermediate, and then from this tetrahedral intermediate, we are going to kick the chlorine out, giving us this organic azide as our product of this step. Now, the next step in the Kurzus rearrangement, if I go back to my scheme over here, once we have our azide, which is this molecule over here, from this point, the only thing that we are doing, we are just heating up our mixture. The delta sign typically represents heat, so that's the only thing we're doing here. No other reagents or anything. But to make it a little bit easier to see what's happening here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to show a different resonance structure for my azide, taking the electrons from the nitrogen and moving them like so, giving me the following resonance contributor. And look at this species, doesn't it look very familiar? What if instead of this N2, I had bromine? That would have been exactly the same species that we had in our Hoffman rearrangement. And since N2 is equally as awesome of a living group as Br, I'm going to indicate here that this is a living group, we are going to have exactly the same style rearrangement, where the alkyl group is going to migrate onto the nitrogen, nitrogen is going to make a double bond with the carbon, and N2, just like the bromine in the previous case, going to pop off as a gas. And as a result, we are going to get exactly the same isocyanate intermediate. So doesn't matter which pathway we are going to take, whether it's Hoffman or Kurzus, we are always going to end up with the isocyanate, which we are then going to proceed to hydrolyze. We can do this hydrolysis in either acidic or basic conditions, and often you're going to see that this hydrolysis is done in slightly
slightly acidic conditions, but I will show you both nonetheless. So in acidic conditions, my step number one would be to protonate my starting material to make it a little bit more electrophilic, giving me the following intermediate, and now water, being kind of a meh nucleophile, can relatively easily attack my electrophilic carbon over here like so, making the following intermediate, from which we are going to immediately pull the proton off, making a carbamic acid intermediate, which is quite unstable, so we are going to use another equivalent of water to deprotonate that, releasing our nitrogen part of the molecule, which gets immediately protonated, giving us our primary amine as our final product. And some of you might protest saying that forming a species like that in the solution is pure madness because negatively charged nitrogen, which is not stabilized by resonance, is incredibly unstable. And yes, you would be right, but remember, the CO2 that we have formed in this step is a gas it flies away, which means that the step where we are making this intermediate is a non-equilibrium step. It is forced by the huge difference in the entropy between the starting material and the final product, so that excess entropy that you are going to be getting here is going to be the driving force and make the step happen. So while writing an intermediate like that might seem a little bit strange in these conditions, it's actually not unreasonable. Now, as I've mentioned, this hydrolysis can also happen in basic conditions. So in basic conditions, we are going to start by taking our hydroxide and attacking our carbon of this isocyanate, and one of the resonance structures is going to have a negative charge on the nitrogen, so I'm going to draw that one right away, looking like this. Now, from this point, we are going to bring water, so we can protonate that nitrogen, so I'm going to show the electrons from nitrogen grabbing the proton from water, bringing us back to the carbamic acid again, which, like in the previous case, we are going to deprotonate, now we're going to be using OH- to do that, giving us our amide CO2 and water, and like in the previous case, nitrogen is going to immediately grab the proton, giving us our primary amine as our final product. And and as I've mentioned a moment ago, you can use either acidic or basic hydrolysis, however, the acidic hydrolysis tends to be a more frequent uh, method of uh, hydrolyzing your isocyanide to give you your amine. But in addition to the aqueous hydrolysis of your isocyanide, you can actually do one more trick, which is going to be the treatment of your isocyanide with alcohols. And again, this reaction is going to be done in either trace amounts of acid or base, so I will show you the acidic mechanism. Like in the case of the acidic aqueous hydrolysis, our step number one is going to be the protonation of the nitrogen in our isocyanate functional group, making the following intermediate, and now, instead of water, we are going to use alcohol as our nucleophile, so it's going to come in, attack the carbon, making the following intermediate, and then I'm going to use another equivalent of my methanol, to come in, pull that proton off, and giving you a carbamate as the final product, which is a marginally useful functional group in organic chemistry, but you might encounter that nonetheless. So, looking back at our reaction scheme over here, you can see that both Kurzus and Hoffman rearrangements, they are almost the same thing, and they are a very neat way how you can take the carboxylic acid and convert that into the corresponding amine, losing one carbon in the process. Now, the cool part about these reactions, these rearrangements, is that they work for virtually any type of a carboxylic acid, but I have to say this with a little bit of a caveat, because reaction is very moody and does tend to give you side products and poor yields for various reasons. So, for the purposes of the introductory organic chemistry course, these rearrangements are still a viable choice uh, if you choose to use them in your multi-step synthesis. Just keep in mind that you are going to be shortening your chain by one carbon, uh, so you have to account that in your retrosynthetic planning. And as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, boop the like button on your way out, watch this video next, and I'll see you next time!